Hello and welcome in to this video, we are going to talk about the Tor network. You may already know the topic from the title, but before we start I want to make a quick note, it is recommended through not necessary to also watch my other video called Is the Internet in Danger? Why? Because one of the reasons you might use Tor is exactly what I described there. In short, a possible future where governments and corporations increase control and censorship on the internet. In this video we will ask three big questions. What are the advantages and disadvantages of using Tor? How reliable and anonymous is Tor in 2025? And finally, if Tor is not good enough, do we already need a completely new solution to escape censorship? Alright, let's not waste any more time and start with the first question. What are the advantages and disadvantages of using Tor? Let's start with the advantages. The first and biggest advantage of Tor is that it's built for anonymity and privacy through something called onion routing. So how does it actually work? Imagine you want to send a message across the internet. Normally your data goes straight from your computer into the destination. And anyone in between can see who you are and where it's going. With Tor it's completely different. Before your message even leaves your device, Tor wraps it in multiple layers of encryption, just like the layer of an onion. When the message enters the Tor network, it first passes through what's called the entry node. This node takes off the outermost encryption layer, which only reveals where to send the message next, not the final destination. Then the message travels to the middle node, which removes the next layer and again sees only the next step, nothing more. Finally, it reaches the exit node, which removes the last layer and sends the message to the final website or service you are visiting. The important part is this. No single node ever has the full picture. The entry node knows who you are, but not where you are going. The exit node knows where the data is going, but not who you are. And the middle node is just a blind messenger passing things along. Because of this layered design, it becomes extremely difficult for anyone to trace your activity back to you, even if they control one or two of the relays. Another important point, and one that casual users often overlook, is the Tor is open source. This means the source code is fully public. Anyone can read it, study it, or even improve it. That's important because it gives transparency. You don't have to blindly trust a company. You can verify there are no backdoors, and it's also better for security. Because if a vulnerability is discovered, the global community of developers can patch it quickly. Unlike a normal VPN, Tor also has the ability to access hidden services. Website at endwich.onion. These sites are not visible on the normal internet and can only be reached through the Tor browser. Why is that? Because Onion sites don't use the global domain system like .com or .org. Instead the addresses are generated as part of the Tor network itself and the Tor browser is built to understand and interpret them. That's why they are invisible outside of Tor. Another big advantage is that Tor is decentralized. This means it doesn't rely on a single company or server. Instead it's powered by thousands of volunteers around the world running relay nodes. If something is centralized, it can never be truly private. Because then one company, one server or one government can control it, read the data or shut it down. Which Tor there is no single point of failure, which make it much harder to take down or monitor. It's also worth mentioning that Tor is cross-platform and very user-friendly. Cross-platform simply means it works on all major operating systems, Windows, macOS, Linux and even Android. You just download the Tor browser, install it and you're ready to go, no advanced setup needed. And finally, Tor has been around for a very long time, more than 20 years. Over the time it has become a tool trusted by serious professionals, journalists, activists, researchers, even governments and law enforcement use Tor in sensitive cases where privacy really matters. Its long history is a proof of reliability. Now let's talk about the disadvantages. The first and most notable one is speed. Tor is very slow compared to normal browsing. The reason is simple, every request you make travels storage at least 3 relays across the world and each relay decrypts and forwards your data. On top of that, most of these relays are run by volunteers, with limited bandwidth. This means pages can take several seconds to load, images and videos are even slower, and streaming or downloading large files is basically unusable. Tor was never designed for performance, it was designed for privacy, and this trade-off is built in into the system itself. Another disadvantage is the way exit nodes work. When your traffic leaves the Tor network at the exit node, it reaches the normal internet again. If the website you visit does not use HTTPS, the exit node can see the data in plain text. This doesn't mean the node knows who you are, but it's called with things like passwords or messages if they aren't encrypted. That's why it's important to remember, Tor protects your anonymity, but it does not automatically protect the content of your data. 
For that you will still need HTTPS or end-to-end -end encryption. Tor is also not designed for peer-to-peer -peer or real-time apps. Things like torrenting, online gaming or live voice calls don't work well through Tor. The reason is that these services need constant high bandwidth two-way communication, and Tor multi-hop design simply cannot provide it without breaking. This makes Tor mostly limited to browsing, messaging or sending information, but not for activities that need speed and stability in both directions. Another limitation is usability on the modern web. Many websites so they use heavy JavaScript, cloud integration and automated detection systems. Because Tor traffic often comes from exit nodes shared by many people, websites sometimes block it entirely or force you to solve endless captures. On some services, features just won't work at all. So while Tor technically gives you the access to the internet, in practice the experience often feels broken compared to using a normal internet connection. It's also important to highlight again, Tor protects your anonymity, but not your data. This is a common misunderstanding. Tor hides your identity by making it difficult to trace your connection, but the data itself is not magically end-to-end -end encrypted. If you visit an unencrypted site or send unencrypted messages, that information is still exposed once it leaves the Tor network. Tor is about hiding who you are, not about protecting what you send. Another disadvantage is simply ease of use. Even though the Tor browser is user-friendly, the overall experience can still be confusing for people who are not technical. You constantly run into blocked services, missing functions or a website that behaves strangely. This makes Tor less reliable as a daily driver for the average person, unless they really know what they are doing and why they are using it. And finally, Tor by default only protects what goes through the Tor browser itself. Apps outside the browser like email clients, cloud software or chat apps are not automatically anonymized. If those apps connect to the internet directly, they will still reveal your real IP address. To cover everything you need to use extra tools like routing your whole operating system to Tor which tails OS. But the standard Tor setup only protects your browsing, not your entire device. Ok, now that we discussed the advantages and disadvantages of Tor itself, we can move on to the second big question. How reliable and anonymous is Tor in 2025? The idea of Tor sounds great on paper, but in the real world there are several problems that can reduce its reliability and anonymity. Let's look at them. One problem is that governments or agencies can run Tor nodes themselves. Since anyone can volunteer to host a relay or an exit node, there is no real barrier stopping an intelligent agency from doing the same. And they do. If they control an entry node, they can lock who connects. If they control an exit node, they can see where the traffic is going. By themselves these pieces don't break Tor, but if one actor controls enough nodes, they can start to connect dots and weaken anonymity. Another issue is traffic correlation. Even if agencies don't control many nodes, they may have the ability to monitor the internet backbone. If they can watch the point where you enter the Tor network and at the same time watch an exit node somewhere else, they can try to match patterns, the size of the traffic and the timing of requests. Over time this can reveal who is talking to who, even without breaking encryption. This is one of the strongest attacks when it comes to global surveillance powers. A related problem comes from malicious exit nodes. Exit nodes are where your traffic finally leaves Tor and goes out in the normal internet. If the site you are visiting is not encrypted with HTTPS, that exit node can read your traffic, inject code or even change files you try to download. There have been real cases of this happening in the past. So while Tor protects your identity, it does not protect you from a bad exit node spying on you or tampering with your traffic. Another big challenge is colored website fingerprinting. Even when you use HTTPS and even when everything is encrypted, attackers can sometimes guess which website you are visiting just by looking at traffic patterns, how many packets are sent, in which order and the timing of the requests. Research has shown that machine learning can identify Tor traffic with high accuracy. For example, a study published at the Eusenic Security Symposium in 2019 called DeepCore demonstrated that Tor traffic could be de-anonymized with up to 96% accuracy under controlled conditions. Now of course in the real world the suggest rate is much lower, but it still shows that Tor anonymity is not perfect. Tor also is another problem. Tor's design assumes that not all parts of the internet are controlled by the same actor, but if an adversary like the NSA or state level agency can monitor a large share of the global internet, Tor's protections become weaker. At that level of power, timing attacks and mass surveillance can de-anonymize users even without breaking the protocol itself. And finally, there is legal and social pressure of not using Tor. In some countries, just connecting to the Tor network is considered suspicious. ISPs may lock it, governments may flag it, 
and in some countries tor traffic is actively blocked. This forces users to rely on tor bridges or otter bypass tools, which are slow and harder to set up. So in practice, even if tor is technically working, the fact that the governments label it as suspicious traffic makes it less reliable as a daily solution. And yeah, since we already discussed the advantages, the disadvantages and also the real world problems of Tor, together with the fact that Tor is super slow and almost unusable for anything except sharing messages, you may ask yourself, is Tor really the solution? Or do we need a completely new approach if we want a censorship free internet? There are already a few projects that try to answer this question. Let's quickly look at some of them. One of the most known is I2P, the Invisible Internet Project. It works similar to Tor but is focused more on hidden services instead of accessing the normal web. It uses a system called garlic routing, which is like onion routing but bundles messages together. It can be faster for certain users, but it's much smaller in size, meaning it has fewer users and fewer services, so adoption is limited. Another project is Freenet. Freenet is designed for complete decentralization. Instead of relays like in Tor, it stores pieces of information across the network and shares them peer-to-peer. -peer. This makes censorship very hard, but it also means that content stay around permanently, even if it's harmful. That creates big challenges in practice, and it never really broke into mainstream use. Then we have LokiNet, which comes from the same developers behind the Oxygen cryptocurrency. LokiNet uses Onion Routing too, but it's built on a blockchain-style incentive system. In theory, this makes the network more sustainable, because people get rewarded for running nodes, but right now it's still experimental and not widely adopted. And finally, there are projects like NIM, which are trying to push anonymity even further. NIM uses what's called mixnets, which are shuffle and delete messages to make traffic analysis much harder than Tor. It looks promising, but it also has the downside of even higher latency, which means it's even less practical for the daily internet use right now. So, as you can see, there are alternatives, each of them brings something new. More decentralization, more anonymity, or stronger censorship resistance. But each also comes with serious trade-offs, whenever that's speed, adoption, or complexity. Beyond that, normal VPNs only hide your IP address in a very primitive way, and they can easily be detected or blocked by servers. So in the end, the best and final solution is just not about technology, it's about fighting for freedom. So we don't reach the point where we absolutely need these tools in the first place. I hope you liked the video, if yes leave a sub and a like, share your own opinion in the comments and see you next time.